Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, it is a special one today. Uh, we're back on that unfiltered series, and we've got today um, one of the coolest people that I know um, in, in the photography world um, who actually created all of those pictures and a lot more, um, which I'm sure most of you know. Um, he's also, strangely, created a load of books, um, which I also have, and we're going to talk about um, a newer one even that's coming out. Um, but over the years, that person, of course, doesn't really need much introduction, but that is Mr. Chris Burkhardt, um, who is now on your screen. Um, so, hi, hi, hi. Chris. Um, you're... Yeah, you're um, out in California, um, obviously. So for those people watching live, if there are little blips and stuff, it's probably because from where I am in the middle of the country in backwards England and where Chris is, there's probably some differences in network connections and all that sort of stuff. But um, we're going to spend the next hour effectively putting questions that you've either already sent um, or have um, into the chat. So if you want to ask Chris a question, um, there's uh, we just had the, the discussion, so no off limits. Um, within legal reasons, obviously, um, but no, go, go, go for it. Put, put whatever questions you want in. Um, and we're going to just ask Chris to sort of cover, um, cover as much as we can. So I guess with that, um, let's get started. In fact, before we do that, Chris, um, I, I can sort of intro you and, and say, you know, how great, um, photography, um, you, you create and, and all of the, you know, these, I've got loads of these things and stuff like that from you. Um, but in terms of where you're positioned as a photographer, how do you describe yourself now? Because I, I know it's changed over the years um, from when you sort of started off surf photographer now to maybe more um, more broad than that. You know, I, I think that's a great, great starting point. And I guess I would say that as much as I love the title of photographer, I feel like it's so incredibly limiting. I mean, so incredibly limiting. And and um, I just had this question yesterday on a uh, podcast that I did with somebody, um, you know, trying to really understand at what point I wanted more. I think that each of us are searching for a multitude of ways and modalities to express oneself, right? If photography is the only medium you have, it can all of a sudden feel very much like you have tunnel vision. And um, it, there was a certain point in my career where I really wanted to explore just other ways in which I could uh, see the world. And so I think directing films and, and trying to tell stories vocally via podcasts or, or doing in-person events, books, um, being an author, like those are all the, the types of hats that I really like to wear. So I don't want to really say like, I'm a photographer because I don't wake up every day and pick up a camera and that's how I make a living. I, every day is a little different. And, um, and I think that at the core of what I love, it's storytelling. I mean, you, you, um, you know, you express this as well, you know, you do this as well, and we all have our own ways to do it. Um, but I do think that the world benefits greater from mm -hmm. telling stories. And I think that the vulnerability that come with telling stories is so crucial to our own growth and the growth of others. Cool. So, Rather handily, and genuinely, this was not scripted. Um, one of the questions that we have, uh, where was it? Oh, you're going to love this now that I put this up. So this was from David. Um, everyone seems to be obsessed with telling a story now. What's wrong with just taking a great photograph of a really nice view? So, that's, Chris. That's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. I mean, if, if you, uh, you want to share the photograph with your grandma or something like that. Um, but I think that people are searching for more. I think that in a world that is so incredibly divided and there's a need to create more bridges and less walls for me, the photographer, and just, this is for me, this is the world according to Chris, you know, David, I don't, I don't know how you see the world or how you view the world. Maybe you've traveled your whole life, but I didn't grow up traveling. I, I got a passport right when I started to take pictures and every single time I've gotten on a plane, it's been because I've had a camera in my hand. So to me, my experience, seeing the world has always been through a camera and being able to bring those images back to people in my family who didn't travel, who didn't see the world, my mom, my dad, <clears throat> who've never been outside the US. For me, it's always been about telling stories, right? I, I don't know if this is a fad or some obsession, yep. but the reality is I feel a sense of responsibility of somebody who's actually been able to go out and see parts of the ends of the earth to bring that back and share it with people. And I, and I would say that everybody should, if you spend enough time in these wild places, 
you should want to protect them or you should want to talk about them or you should want to advocate for them. And I can't think of a better thing to be obsessed with than sharing the vulnerable experiences we have out at the ends of the earth. I mean, to me, that's really like sure. it's the byproduct of having a privilege, privileged life and being able to go out and see these things and document it. Yeah. And so, so actually, funnily enough, on, on that um, thread, as it were, um, so moving, moving on from um, Dave, we had Lisa was asking, um, so to, to that end, so what made you fall in love with Iceland? Um, have you noticed, and this is yeah. especially key, I guess, have you noticed any changes to their culture over the years following mass tourism? Um, which Great. You know, I, Great I've question. been there for every now and then, and I've seen small changes, but you've been there a lot. Um, probably more than several Icelandic people. So you must have seen stuff move on. Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's kind of a long answer, to be honest. I'm going to try to, you know, sync it up. But I fell in, in love with Iceland because I was, I was working in a particular field of photography, shooting for magazines and traveling around the world for, um, for surf magazine, shooting uh, places that were incredibly beautiful, but not inspiring to me. They didn't give me what I felt like I needed uh, when it came to the kind of um, the value of the image, like what I was having to put out there to create. And when I went to Iceland for the first time, I just fell in love. It was 2006 or 2007, right around there. I've been there 54 times. Every time has been for work. Um, and now I, I do own an apartment there and I, I bring my family there. I want to raise my kids there part of the year. I want to introduce them to this culture that I feel like is so incredibly in tune with the landscape around them. So incredibly aware of, of um, the finiteness of life. And I say that in a very real way, they have a saying called theta veta, which means it'll all work out because as an Icelander, you, you can't plan for the future. There could be a volcano erupting. You don't know. Oh, what's so you you happen, can't plan right? for tomorrow, let alone, let alone three yeah. years time or whatever. Yeah. The weather can be so bad. And so it forces them to live in the moment, in the present. And I love that. I mean, I love nothing more. And my fascination with Iceland really came from first working there, then all of a sudden falling in love with the landscape, and then all of a sudden really advocating to protect the landscape and create a national park. And, and I got involved with the government in some ways and got involved with some really special people there. And so my, my, fascination is more than just going there to, to earn a living, right? It's also about wanting to um, advocate for this incredible place and, and work with the people that I care about there. In terms of changes to culture, I haven't noticed changes to culture, but I've noticed obviously changes in the landscape um, from mass tourism. And I think that one of the things I would, I would really urge people to be aware of is, uh, and you know, I'm not gonna just pump myself up here, but I, I wrote a book about Iceland's tourism um, and some of its issues it's facing as well as some of its solutions. It's called at Glacier's End and it, and it really talks about its glacial river systems and um, and kind of dives into some of these, these issues. So I, I spent a lot of time researching this, um, even spoke at a government panel about this subject. One of the things to realize is that Iceland is a massive country. Um, there is so much space. And when spread out, there's actually no real problem with tourism. What the issue is, is that you get on the plane to go there and what's advertised to you is this stopover, this yeah. six hour stretch of coast that you can easily access in a day or two days. And so what happens is 90% of the tourists, they never go further than five hours out of Reykjavik, right? Sure. What, what does that mean for people in the east? What does that mean for people in the west fjords? What does that mean for people in the, like, well, there's farmers who have given up the farm, created Airbnbs to, in the hopes that this tourism boom would come to them. And it never did because people are sometimes just, they, they don't have a lot of time or sometimes people are lazy or they just don't want to go and explore. And so I think what the issue is, is that we've been, there's a marketing issue. There's not a tourism issue. Um, and obviously Icelanders, they, they've never really been great about preparing for the long term. They've always been great about preparing for the short term. So there's been a lot of short term solutions created to long term problems. And yeah. I've really tried to advocate for people exploring off the beaten path out in the more remote parts of the country where absolutely tourism would be would be appreciated. In fact, tourism, um, you, you can look at it however you want. You know, I think that to look at it 
from purely a negative space would be um, would be uh, not fair to truly what it can be and the beauty that it can provide because it's because of tourism that places get protected. It's because of tax dollars that go into that 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 places become yeah. national parks and and that's that's the only way. If people don't visit them, people don't care about them. They they won't become protected. That's just how it works. Um, yeah. And if I had to um, compare some of my notes, some of my studies about extractive industries versus tourism, I would say that tourism is an absolutely much better option because it's controllable, because it's manageable, and it's a, there are resources, yes, that are at risk, but but those can be can be managed and they can be um, they can be in some way guided, and it's not like we're dealing with aluminum smelters damming the rivers or um, polluting the water or overfishing, which is a lot of the alternative sources of income that the country sure. has. And it, so uh, to that point, actually, so you literally um, were responsible for setting up things like this. So Westfield's yeah. Way. Um, <laughs> so for those that don't know, Chris um, kind of likes being on a bike every now and then, <laughs> uh, including one that's like 600 miles worth of, of a pretty hard track around Iceland. So, so yeah. you recently did that, um, launched that up in Iceland last year. I think. Yeah, it's actually becoming a stage race, which means it's like going to be an actual certified kind of bike race in the country. And I guess the thing I would say is that, again, I, I, I know my influence. I'm aware of my impact on this country and, and other countries. I, I get that. So when I go, I really try to be thoughtful of like, am I promoting human powered adventure? Am I promoting real authentic experience? Or am I just going to like, Skogafoss every time I go there, right? So for me, yeah. um, working with tourism uh, and knowing that they want to advocate for people to come there during 2020 and, and even prior to the West Fjords, it's this small ear clove of the country. It's so beautiful, so remote, but they had like half of the hotel reservations that were made were canceled. And this is prior to COVID just because people would get to Iceland and they'd be like, I want to go to the West Fjords. And then all of a sudden they'd be like, oh, it's like a five hour drive. I'm not going to do that. That's too far. And so I really wanted to advocate for like the beauty of a place like this and how important it is to go and see these more remote areas because they, again, they would, they thrive from these visitors. These visitation is, is huge. Tourism is huge for them. And um, the West Fjords way is just a beautiful uh, multi-day bike ride, or you can do a section of it, or you can do, you know, eight days. And you can go experience and explore maybe the best of what this place has to offer, um, you know, with your own two yeah. legs. And and ultimately, it's just a it's just another way of experiencing a, a location, a country. I I, I tend to try to um, personally take on the challenge of seeing places in a more slow, methodical way, as opposed to like, I've got five days. Let me see all the greatest hits. Let me find all the bangers, yeah. right? Like. Um, well, the, and that's really yeah, the golden thing. circle on a bus deal sort of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I always call it like big game hunting. You're like going to stop, you know, shoot, you know, pull out your rifle and like just find the big game along the way, you know. Yeah. So, and, and to be fair on that, the, so the guys that are, are watching, you know, um, Jed's saying, you know, Northern Iceland and the inner part of uh, the country is absolutely amazing. Um so good. Uh, where are we? Uh, Barry, actually, I'd love to do the bike ride in Iceland. Um, yeah. I hope you're fit, Barry. I mean, I assume you are, but yeah, that one looks pretty, pretty robust. Um, I'll tell so you one let's... thing: there are so many waffle stops along the way. I I consumed more <laughs> waffles on that ride than than I've ever done in my entire life. It was it was incredible. Nice. <laughs> um, so on that, I mean, obviously, um, there, there was some news recently. Um, so actually, someone made it. It was actually a non, it was a non-question question, but uh, from Alan. So not a question, but just wanted to say how sorry I was to read about the passing of your friend Volcano Pilot in Iceland. Yeah. Um, the images from your flights with him have been a huge inspiration to me, uh, and I'd like to thank you for that. Um, so you know, yeah, this guy Harold Er. Um, is a, a friend of you. I mean, you've you've known him for years and years, um, yeah. and a lot of you know things like the books that you produced are as a result of flying with Harold. So sadly, yeah. um, a couple of weeks ago he passed away. Um, but I know you're now doing some um, stuff to try and keep that memory going um, and, and try and um, try and help. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, I'm doing a, a print fundraiser right now. That's immediately all the funds are going to support his family. 
um, going to support um, his memorial service. It's actually scheduled for the 25th of uh, this month. I'll be flying over there and and taking part in that. And um, you know, I'll just I'll just say to that experience, like it's really special when you find somebody who shows you a world that you never knew, shows you the beauty of the world that, that you you didn't even you couldn't conceive of. And I think that's what was so special is that there's not many friendships in your life where when you come together, you always create something. And so every time we were with one another, we were creating something. It's my, my love for this place, this country, and my awareness of the river systems and, and the dams and all. It comes from, from him. He would literally fly me around and educate me. He would, um, he was the one that kind of fueled that fire. And, and my, the book that I made at Glacier's End um, and all that work, seven years of, of work flying with him was directly because of his influence. And um, I would also say that, you know, as somebody, you know, just to be vulnerable, I think that somebody like myself, I didn't grow up with a dad and I, um, um, he passed away before I was born. So I think I've always looked to these like male figures um, in my life as, as people who could be of influence. He became that person for me in many ways, you know. Um, there was even a time in Iceland where like, I, I remember I was finishing a shoot. I had nowhere to stay. Everything was booked. And I, he's like, yeah, come stay in my house. Like I'll, I'll, you can stay in one of my kids' rooms. And I just, I look back at those experiences and, um, they're so special. You know, he's such a special person. Sure. I'll just lastly say that it's very unique when you think of somebody like that, every person that got into his plane for the most part was a stranger and he would take these yeah. total strangers and he would show them the uttermost beauty that he could find. And what's so cool is that it's rare that you talk to somebody and they, they don't say, oh, my, my flight with Harold or my flight with Diego was the very best part of my whole Icelandic experience. So thinking about that, thinking about somebody who provided people with the very best experience, like how cool is that? And I... I've really tried to kind of um, exchange a lot of this this grief for gratitude, knowing that like I was so lucky to have a such a good friend and such an amazing person that shared that with me. So, yeah, no, for sure. Uh, so it's funny. Um, well, in, in a way, you, you mentioned um, Diego as as his name. So um, on a slight link to that, uh, where are we? Gopal, I saw you keep and breed alpacas. Uh, is there a particular reason you chose them over other animals? Like you could have got a cat. So, yeah. <laughs> Good point. you know, I, uh, so yeah, it's pretty simple. I live in like a rural area. I live in central California. I have like five acres of property and it's, you have to trim the weeds for fire safety. Right. So we had to make defensible space where we have like all that trimmed up. And, and honestly, we got the animals cause we're like, well, they're going to, they're going to eat all this grass. And it was actually like more effective. And then we could obviously take the fiber and we could process it and give it to people. And, and they're just really cool animals. I also have two boys, young boys. I wanted them to have responsibility and something that they could like take care of and manage. So that was a part of it. And plus they're just like such cool pets. They're rad. I mean, it definitely turned into something more. Um, but our original idea was like, well, how, we need something for the property. <laughs> you do. I was so, going to say, yeah, you, you bought some lawnmowers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> effectively yeah <laughs> and then um yeah the the, yeah. the diego link so this was, was this is this yeah from last week or yeah this is we just we have these two um swiss sheep called uh vias vias black nose sheep um and uh they're they're a swiss breed really cool super friendly and, and i we we bred our alpacas we had two babies we had to sell them because we couldn't keep all of them, but then we got some sheep to, um, to basically kind of help with the property. And again, we just, you know, it's kind of like a useless farm makes no real sense, but we, we enjoy the opportunity to raise them. And it has pristine grass all year round by the sound of it. <laughs> exactly. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, so actually on that point, Tim just made a question. So you mentioned, um, obviously your two kids. Um, one of the first books, obviously that you brought out was, um, the boy that spoke to the the earth, um, which was for one of your kids at the time. Um, so yeah. Tim's just, oh, let me just move that. So Tim's just asked, has Chris got any more plans to write any more children's books? I guess as they're getting um, older. 
It's a great, it's a great question, Tim. I, I mean, you know, it's funny. I never, I never imagined writing a children's book. It wasn't like in my five year plan. Um, the opportunity kind of arose uh, with a publisher and, and I guess in some way I felt like, man, this is a, this will be an experiment. And I'm so grateful that it turned out well and that it, it really spoke to a lot of kids around the world. And, and during COVID, it especially became a useful tool. It was turned into a curriculum, won some awards, et cetera, et cetera. I've actually thought about making, um, working on another children's book with my wife and she started to write it. Um, and, and it would be a little more geared towards, um, obviously the boy who spoke to the earth is, is meant for all kids, but we wanted to make one that was more specifically geared towards, towards young girls and, um, kind of some of the, the challenges and things that they, they are raised with. So it's in the works. It's, it's a thought, but if we haven't like poured a ton of time and attention into it, but I, I'm, I'm honored that people even like know about it, that people care about it. And, and to me, it's, it's probably my proudest piece of work. And I, and it's funny to say that because there's no, none of my photos in it, but my photographs inspire the, the drawings sure. and the, the artistry. So on, on, and actually on that um, note, so um, David, I think a different David um, had asked, you know, can you talk a little about how you come up with the concepts and subjects of your books? Obviously now, since then, you have released quite a few photography yeah. books. Um, so does someone commission them or do you wait until you have a large enough collection of images on a theme to publish something? So that, how is that now working, I guess? That's a great question, David. Honestly, I love talking about publishing. It's one of my favorite subjects. I've been doing it for a while. Um, and I have a lot of experience because I've worked with big publishers, Chronicle and, and Abrams and um, Terra and whatnot. And then I've done self-published projects like The Boy Who Spoke to the Earth um, and, and some other smaller books as well that we've, we've kind of done. My At Glacier's End, um, the book about Iceland's rivers, that was totally self-published. I made it my, myself. Um, I think what it comes down to is, is a couple things. And I'll, I'll talk about this from two perspectives because it's kind of a hard thing to just like gloss over. But I would say that first of all, from like more of a financial and, and practical standpoint, when publishing a book, um, the key component is to figure out and work backwards. Like what's your end goal? Is your end goal to make something that can be like a great marketing tool to have on a, uh, uh, you know, to have in the hands of everybody and for them to see your work or is your objective to make money? Um, and, and to collect money and, and there's no right or wrong answer there. You just need to work through that because if you self publish, you have the opportunity to make more money and cre retain creative control, but you're going to have to put up all the front money to, to get those books cheap enough to sell. Like right? that's all there is to it. There's no, there's no special like phone to China that, you know, the publisher calls and they get the books for 25 cents. They just, they, they're the ones putting in all the money to then get it cheap enough so that they can resell it. Right. Sure. So if you, if you have a network, if you have a distribution platform in some way, or you have people that can help you, et cetera, et cetera, you can self publish and you can make a book and you can make good money from it and retain the creative control, but you're going to have to do all the marketing, all the design, all the layout, et cetera, et cetera. Working with a larger publisher, there's restrictions, right? They, they have, um, you, well, you they're, sell they're driving. a concept. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. They're driving and they, they have the distribution platforms. They have the PR, the marketing, um, they have the designers in house, but they're also going to be in some ways controlling the content, the size, the scope, the cover, they want it to fit a certain pillar of, of like, you know, cost that they're used to working with. Um, so I think that with that, you have to be cognizant that you're going to have to make some exceptions and, or you're going to have to kind of, you know, work within the scope of what they, um, they're comfortable with. And, and I think that when it comes to like concepts for a book, um, what I've found is that no big publisher out there is going to just be like, yes, let's do a retrospective of your life's greatest work. Like that's so, so, so rare. They want to have a focused body of work. For me, my books have been the California surf project. It was about a 50 day journey from Oregon to Mexico on the California coast. It was all about just that one experience. And then I've done, um, you know, I've obviously done my children's book. I've done come hell or high water or the torpedo people, which is about body surfing. 
I did a book um, called High Tide, which was magazine articles from Surfer Magazine with the images all pushed together. My latest book, Wayward, is more of a, a pseudo memoir where it's it's the similar images to High Tide, but with my experiences, my writing, and a little more personal interaction. I was so say, yeah, we've we've got that one here. So this is yeah, uh, your, you know, your latest one is is literally um, it, it's all the I guess the the hidden stuff, the stuff that yeah that isn't it's, it's told. A, it's during funny. The it's funny because it's a bit more focused. On, and I'd love to send you one uh, as well, Paul. I'll I'll make sure we mine's already it's, it's already well. waiting for me in California. It's just I haven't been uh, able to get it. <laughs> okay, great. Um, well, yeah, this is an interesting project because to be honest, like, I don't think that I, I mean, in the process of writing this, I constantly was like, I should not be writing this book. I should, nobody cares about my perspective. Nobody, you know, you're a photographer, you get it, Paul, like the hardest thing is that we spend our lives glorifying landscapes, glorifying people doing portraits, building up other people and, and, and their achievements. And so it's weird to, to, turn the light back on myself and say, well, this was my experience from these places. This was, this was what I felt and what I learned. And there are a lot of moments where I sit there and I question if anybody's going to care or give a crap about any of this. Um, but it's been really meaningful and the process of writing it has been very vulnerable. And so I, I do feel like finding a good concept or a good thought or a good idea, um, with when you do pitch a book or you do pitch a project with this one, uh, in particular, just to be totally transparent, I had a publishing agent now. Um, her name is Kitty Cowles, and she worked with me to basically, you know, we, we talk every couple months about a new book idea. And, you know, those books obviously take like two years, sometimes three years to sure. make. And we, we pitched this idea to Abrams, the publisher, about doing a memoir. And they were like, well, what if we do like a pseudo memoir, photo book? Um, and we sold them on the idea and then it was the process of like you know working with a ghostwriter and and working with uh, an editor and, and putting it all together it took a long time <laughs> yeah I, I bet i mean the, the good news i guess is if, if you if it's effectively a memoir from shoots that you've done you have the material um it's just a yeah. case of of them putting it into a, a format that works and, and i've just seen paul's just asked a, a question live so how did your first break come about for the publishing of books were you commissioned or did you um self-publish excellent question so this is a funny story actually um and it's 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 in that book but i'll tell you right now it's i i applied for a grant at the very end of an internship i did with transworld surf i was like 19 years old I had just finished interning at Transworld for the summer. It was a surf magazine in Southern California. There was an editor named Larry Flame who died, and he was the editor of another magazine, uh, a competitor, but he was kind of like the godfather of surf photography. And ultimately, I applied for this grant. It was like $5,000. It was to the best up and coming surf photographer, and I with that grant, I said, well, I, what I really want to do with this money is I want to do a book that celebrates surf culture of California. And I mean, it was such a over the top goal. I mean, I needed like new tires on my truck. My bank account could have <laughs> used like some money. I, I was living off of like 50 cent burritos in Southern California. I had the worst equipment in the world. I should have really given that money to a lot of these other things. But I instead, when I won, I used that $5,000 to fund a 50 day road trip of the coast of California. Now I didn't have a book deal. I didn't have a relationship with a publisher, but it, it had been put out there in the world. People had talked about it. Obviously there was some press around me winning and I was working with an editor, Marcus Sanders from Surfline at the time who kind of covered the trip. He knew an editor at Chronicle books in San Francisco. Um, Sarah Malarkey, who basically was the surf editor at the time. She worked on all ocean related books. And so we brought her the content and I was like, here's my images. And she was like, okay, where's the words? And I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> what do you yeah, mean? I don't words? do words. Like, I do the pictures. <laughs> yeah. And, and so th this was like my first big break, right? It was a long process. It took like three years. I think that I was, um, you know, I think that we pitched the book to them in 2006 and in 2009, it came out. It was called the California Surf Project. It's still in touch today. Um, it's or it's still in, in yeah, it's still in, in print yeah. today. 
And it's, it's an awesome book that's really meant to celebrate um, the, the surf culture of California. We surfed in every coastal county. We had a really focused time frame of like 50 days in a Volkswagen bus, you know, traveling through like November, December, which is like peak season. Um, and, and it was a, a focused narrative and it really came to life in that way. So um, I, I pitched it. Yeah, I, we got paid like a meager amount of money and then we got we got royalties um and sure. we still get royalties from it today yeah sure um well in, in fact it's one of the things that uh, i guess a lot of um the, the goal isn't necessarily to get someone to pay for the book the goal is actually to drive a secondary um, or ongoing income stream um yeah from it, i guess and and you're, you're spot on paul and, and with that book i i really had to sit there and decide like what do i want from this i wanted it to go everywhere i wanted it to be a marketing tool which it which it did, it brought forth a lot of other work, especially at a young time in my career when I, when I needed the exposure, it was a huge tool for that. But I definitely would say that like the book never paid for the cost of making it, you know, for the cost of doing the trip and, and all those things. As a, uh, as a bit of an endorsement. Um, so there you go, ballsy to spend the grant that way. Well done. Um, so, yeah. so yeah, that paid I off. I felt cool. the same way. There was about a thousand dollars worth of parking tickets from the trip. Um, <laughs> ouch. <laughs> so I uh, just, um, as a sort of a, a bit of a, I guess, sort of halfway break as it were. Um, I just want to switch across to some of the images out of the wayward book. Um, cause you've sent yeah. them across and just sort of, I mean, this one, um, is, is one of your, I guess, classic shots, um, not necessarily, um, linked to wayward, but. Um, I mean, this is Iceland, obviously. Um, you've you've pretty York. much shot, yeah. You've pretty much shot everywhere. I think in Iceland now. Uh, that's fair to get or fair to say. Um, but then, obviously, we've, we've got some of the aerials in there. Um, so this one yeah. being um, linked to what we were talking about before. Um, yeah. This shot. So that when we're talking about that sort of surf van life and all that sort of thing, that there's a yeah. lot of your work that includes that as an element. Right, so mm -hmm. it, it's it's very yeah. much about the people in the shot. It's about um, the, the I guess the surfers in in context and whatever. So, is that something yeah, you, that, you a, that you've always you done, point. or yeah? Well, yeah, it's funny because there somebody mentioned this earlier, like you know, um, being obsessed with story. I would also say that nowadays we're kind of obsessed with with you know putting the subject into the landscape. When really, for me, coming from the surf background it was always about the subject was always there like i was doc i come from documenting surfers and athletes right yeah. you, i have a subject if anything my style of work was really about taking a step back and trying to show the landscape that the athlete found themselves in so it's a funny thing because i think that in my body of work i've always just kind of thought about well i i, I want to you know I want to do the opposite. You know, I kind of want to add this, this landscape, take this step back, show a more broad perspective. Cause I was obviously very inspired by landscape photography, very sure. inspired by Ansel Adams and Michael Fatali and all these people. And I knew that that wasn't a career path I could necessarily follow um, because I just didn't have the means, a, a gallery. I didn't have the equipment and had the time to go out and wait. Uh, but, you know, starting my career in magazine work, shooting, beautiful places, I felt like I still wanted to bring an element of landscape photography to the table, um, whether or not I was shooting athletes or surfers or whatever. So I feel like this photograph is an example of that marriage of those two concepts. And that was really how, yeah. you know, and, and again, now, nowadays, this might be commonplace. I don't know. Um, I don't really care. But to me, this is like what I always wanted to create. And what I always tried to create, and at times it would drive my editors crazy because they're like, "Well, we we can't see the logos, we can't see this," and I'm like, "Great, that's I don't care about that. <laughs> I want to create photographs that are timeless, that give a sense of space and scale." And and I mean, with a photograph like this, I wish we had all the images leading up to it so I could show you how it kind of came to life because it was like, you know. There was this, you know, the truck was there and I was just taking photos of the truck because it was so cool. And I saw these clouds forming and then I realized there was this like really still water. So I walked around and then somebody was already sitting up there and then all this and somebody was fishing. And then I was like, hey, you know, can you jump up there with them? And I tried to frame it up, you know, so that the images kind of evolve and come to life. But the point of this photo was I was 
looking for an opening spread for our Kamchatka Russia article. You know, right. I wanted to have, um, you know, all of this is very, you know, thought, thoughtful, right? Like I'm thinking through this frame. We were driving this incredible, you know, 18 passenger Russian Soviet military truck. <laughs> It, it speaks to the landscape. It speaks to the fact that we're not, you know, in the Western US, we're somewhere different, we're somewhere remote. Um, you know, it feels like an expedition, the, the, the sunset, the reflection, it's weighted right in the center. This ended up being the opening spread. Why? Because I was looking and I'm always looking for an image that tells a deep story. Yes, I love adding my own personal perspective to it. I love adding, I'm obsessed with telling the story, but when I can have a photograph that really does help tell that story for me, um, to me, that's the sign of a successful photograph. Sure. Yeah, that, uh, absolutely. Um, so I, obviously on that photograph, you, you sort of mentioned some of it was spontaneous rather than being um, sort of planned, as it were. Um, so just a question from Wayne. So what, what happens when you get a creative block and how do you overcome it? And what motivates you to continue taking pictures well, there we go. Economically, politically, yeah. intellectually, or emotionally. That's, that's quite a deep question, yeah. Wayne. That's a great question, <laughs> Wayne. And honestly, uh, very, very thoughtful. Um, creative blocks are very much a real thing. And I think that to come back to like the first, one of the first questions that you asked, you know, what, what do you see yourself as today? I think that if I was still only a photographer, I would have a lot more creative blocks. I would feel very frustrated because it would be like only having one language, you know, or only knowing how to use a fork. And sometimes when you want to eat soup, you, you, it's really frustrating to eat with a fork. So you, you need to have a, a, a series of tools you can use to express oneself. And I think that that is the biggest and most important thing that I've found is like, if I can hone a series of tools um, to express myself, then I don't get as blocked creatively. Um, I definitely find myself at times wearing a lot of hats, right? Like I, you know, I'm on a, right now we're doing a podcast series and then I've got to go into like a meeting to talk about something as a, as a brand influencer. And then I have to go uh, straight into a, a piece that I produce for Nat Geo and talk about that project. And then I've got to go look at some still images. So there's a lot to manage at times, but being able to have those different outlets keeps me inspired. I also think that having my, my hands somewhere involved in a personal project, uh, meaning something that like isn't there just to make money, it's there because I'm passionate about it, and an environmental project is really important. So I, I always try to keep those two things on like the back burner where I'm constantly working on something that to me feels like I'm, I'm protecting, advocating, or um, you know, bringing awareness to a place that I love. And then also I'm telling a story that is meaningful to me about a person, place, or thing. And although those, those projects don't always like, they don't pay the bills. They don't always come to life. Sometimes they take years um, and they sit on a shelf even. They're so important to have as a way to just keep yourself, again, from, you know, getting a creative. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So on um, just thinking of outside of um, photography, there's a there's a good question in here. Well, it's a difficult question in here, I think, for you. But if you had to give one of them up. Now, now I'm just going to clarify this. I rewrote this question because the question actually was originally a little more brutal about which you're going to lose, your hands or your legs. But if you had to give one of them up, would it be cycling or would it be clicking buttons on a camera? Uh, I mean, I think that for sure it would be cycling. I mean, photography is my my first love it's my the way it's it's the it's the way that i learned to see the world right it was my greatest teacher right it was only because of photography that i felt like i got a chance to go and witness the beauty that was out there and i i owe everything to it cycling is just a a fun way of uniting in my in my mind like landscape with experience right that's all it is and when it can tell a story awesome Right. Yeah. Sure. Um, but if anything, you know, I, I would never give up photography. I mean, it's it's always going to and, and nowadays it's always at our fingertips. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's right there. So, yeah. Well, you know, we um, we talked to I think it was um, Joe Cornish a few months ago. And, and the fact remains now, most photographers and you'll be, I'm sure, exactly the same. Ninety five percent of the shots that you take are on your phone. They're not on your camera anymore. It's so true. Um, 
so well sorry at camera because obviously the phone is now yeah. a camera that also happens to make phone yeah. calls um yeah. so actually just, i guess sort of to cast back some time so michael asked um and I actually I like this question because it, it it's um it's a bit of a challenge to the standard question, which is it's always difficult to look at the old masters' work and 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 work out how they got to uh, their break. Because and actually you look at it, you know people refer to things like Ansel Adams, like you know, all the guys from you know a hundred years ago almost, and 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 actually yeah, times were different then. Even forty years ago, times were different, but nowadays things are very different so you know hence the question which is your story seems to be a lot more recent and relevant so other than other than using instagram um could you possibly give some advice to those trying to break into the commercial and lifestyle market absolutely um and i think one of the the things i would i would say about this paul great great question love talking about this subject um I made a I made a pretty extensive business of photography workshop um, with the Wildest Co. Where I really talk at length about this for like you know eighteen hours. So I just I don't want to you know. So keep in mind my my two minute response here might be um, a little you know uh, disingenuous in terms of how much there is to it. But the first thing I, I just want to comment on is that I, I know Ansel Adams' work very well. Um, I've been able to actually go behind the scenes and look at his journals, his diaries and in, in, um, out in Flagstaff where they, they, the Center for Creative Photography, where they keep a lot of his work. Um, I've been in touch with the family and, um, and the foundation. And one thing to keep in mind is that um, Ansel was truly appreciated mostly after his death. Um, sure. It's also important to understand that much like myself and many other people out there, what Ansel did to photograph landscapes was often done in his free time or with grant money that he would occasionally get from um, the government or from other environmental initiatives he would have to go and, and photograph you know la public waterways and other commercial assignments that weren't so glamorous um, to to make ends meet and i think it's important to recognize that um that obviously social media is an incredible tool but i do not think it should be the first space that photographers go to to try and bring awareness to their work or make a living. Um, personally, for me, uh, commercial photography is still at the core and the root of everything that we do. Um, sure. Along with that, I would say that directing uh, motion as well as producing is, is the, the probably the top three components of, of what we've built our business upon. Um, advice to those trying to break into that world, the first thing I would say is that no brand or company or client is ever going to hire you to shoot something that they have zero examples of experience that you've created. That what I mean by that is like you need to go out and create the portfolios that you want to be shooting. Um, along with that, you can use social media as a way to promote those portfolios of what you have created or what you are creating, but the biggest and most important thing is that that people see that you are proficient that you are you have your head wrapped around the concept of what you're trying to do for example um i was going to iceland back in 2006 2008 back then it cost like three thousand bucks to rent a land rover defender for like the course of a week or whatever it is i remember paying that money out of pocket because i wanted to, to develop a automotive portfolio that I could put in front of brands to prove to them that I was worth hiring to shoot a car sure. spot someday or something like that or, or to to that I knew my way around vehicles that I could make them look cool and sexy and awesome right um, so I was always thinking about how I could develop that next portfolio and nowadays my portfolio around aerial photography it's predicated upon the tens of thousands of dollars I've spent to go fly whenever I've had the opportunity. Um, sure. I'm lucky that now I've been able to be hired by Apple and other brands to shoot aerial photography for them commercially. But this always came about because I was first investing in myself and investing in those portfolios. As somebody who used to work on staff for Patagonia um, as a retainer photographer, the lifestyle market, it's really simple. They're never going to hire somebody that doesn't know how to use their clothes, how to wear their clothes, is not interested in their clothes. So maybe instead of just 
trying to put good energy out into the world and, and simply ask someone to hire you, buy some of their equipment, go out and use it in your daily life, show that yep. you know how to use it and, and that you are proficient in doing so. And typically for a brand like that, they, they want to see somebody who is um, cognizant and aware of, of how it's meant to be used. What are the situations um, before they maybe put you, tell you to go shoot on spec, right? Or something like that. Um, so, I mean, th there's so much to that. This is such a great question. I don't want to um, just bury it with like a couple sure. tiny pieces of info, but I would definitely say like, reach out to me or check out my workshop and, and I, I'd be happy to dive a lot deeper into that. I was going to say, so that, that was the, the round trip version of 18 hours condensed into about three minutes. So, so there we go. 18 go seconds, on. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, just, uh, I'm going to pull up the next question. So the uh, I, we had a little blip of camera stuff, I think. However, um, we're, we're fine. So um, the question, I'm going to switch across to one of your images so we can sort of talk through it. But um, from Stephen, so how much processing do you think is acceptable in an image? Do commercial shoots ever push you to go beyond what you would normally edit? So if, for example, I, I'm going to pull up... Uh, Let's say this shot here. Um, so, you know, how far, I guess, out of camera would you say you would push a shot normally? And and to that question about, you know, does, do the commercial pressures ever push you beyond where you would do and say, for you, no, this is okay? Yeah, it's a great, it's an excellent question. Um, something I, I, I love talking about this stuff. I love breaking into like the behind the scenes of a shot. This photo was shot with a nine stop neutral uh, graduated neutral density filter. That's why there's a big dark kind of um, part at the top yeah, of mountain. the mountain. Yeah. Why? Because the sunset was, you know, 15 stops brighter than the house. <laughs> That's, you know, this is how you do it in camera. You know, here's the thing is I think that, I think that what I find is that there's a lot of pushback sometimes from people who haven't spent time in the dark room. To me, it's all about time. Right. Like I, I studied under um, a large format landscape photographer, Michael Fatali, who is just he's a master. Right. I mean, he would he had incredible galleries in Vegas and Park City and all over. And um, one of the things that's so interesting is like he would spend hours on each image, perfecting it, you know, have burning and dodging and using this filter and that filter. And I got to be transparent, like there is no element to what you do on a computer that in some way becomes more pure and natural what you do in a dark room. Coming from the magazine world and, and having shot slide film, ectochrome, um, you know, geez, ectochrome, Velvia, et cetera, et cetera. The amount of time people would have to spend to take that film, put it into a scanning drum, and then afterwards take it into a computer and remove all of the scanning casts off of it, the blue, the this, the that, it was exorbitant, right? It took a yeah. lot of time and a lot of energy. And I got to witness that firsthand going to digital and seeing now how simple it can be to make subtle changes. Um, I, I, I feel nothing but appreciation for the medium. Now, I think that one of the things I feel is that when I'm delivering an image to a client, um, I'm, I'm oftentimes working with a client that I feel has a sense of um, reputation. And I know that they're not going to manipulate my image in a way that's going to be so out of control that it's going to lose sense of who I am. It's also a collaboration. You need to understand that sometimes you need a, a collaborative effort and you need to think about it from a collaborative perspective that you are creating work that they might want to put into a lookbook or a catalog and they might want to make it black and white or they might want to pump the colors or they might... They have a different look like it doesn't always mean it's going to just be your vision and that's the only vision. So I would definitely say that um, I tend to I tend to like be a little more open minded when it comes to post processing, um, when, when other people take my images. For me personally, um, the biggest and most important things is that my images print well, that they look good when they get printed. And I think that there are certain parameters where images fall apart. What looks good on social media doesn't always look great on a wall printed sure. at 40 by 60, right? Like this image here, like if, if it was unacceptable on a wall, I would never share it because I can't have a client saying, I want to buy this. And then they, they put it on their wall and it looks terrible. So 
to me, that's a huge part of it. Um, I test all my images. I, I found a certain level of, um, of uh, I guess you could say, post-processing that I'm comfortable with. A big part of that I, I do dive into in certain workshops. It's kind of hard to describe right now, but ultimately I avoid at all costs adding any saturation. I mean, right. even this image, I could, I could literally show you the video of me editing it and adding like 2% maybe saturation because there's so much color that can come from working with the individual darks and lights and if you go in and you use brushes much like you would in a dark room and sure. you just work with basically the the uh, the warmth or the coolness of an image i look at things in only two tonal values cool and warm because that's really all you have right and so i i either want to make something more warm or more cool and in doing so, you're working on selecting a certain area, warming that up, taking the color that's already there and just enhancing that warmth or bringing it down, making it more cool. In doing so, yeah. you create a more three-dimensional image, which is really important because those two colors contrast. Um, so to me, that's, that's kind of the, the, the way in which I approach it. Um, it's a little more analytical. Uh, it's a little less like by feel. Um, cause, because I feel like if I don't set parameters for myself, then I can just blow the roof off and, you know, sure. take all my slider bars to 40% and, and just call it good. It's interesting. You, you mentioned there about, um, I get, uh, well, so the approach of, I prepare it for print. Um, because in, in part, and we, we talk about this with, um, with, with guys online quite often, which is preparing stuff for screen is a whole different ball game to preparing something for print and and i see it quite often where someone's produced something that looked amazing in a you know three by three square um as it were and then someone comes along and says yeah i'd love to have that on my wall they print it and it looks bad it, it's just not yeah. designed for that medium so the the approach of almost design it for print first and use the processing at that level and then come sort of come back from that when it comes to going on screen um, yeah. kind of works, I think, um, as, a, as an approach. I, I definitely think that that's what I've realized over the years is that, um, is that if uh, I'm sharing something on social media, it's on a backlit screen, it's going to look great, right? It almost always does. But when you're going to print something, you, you tend to need to bump up the exposure just a little bit, have it a sure. little brighter because it's going to be a little darker, right? That's, yeah. that's one of the key components. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's, uh, where are we at? A couple guys live. So Marcus, uh, do you often look at your old pictures or how do you celebrate your own work? Do you have to, or do you have, or do you take the time for this? Do I celebrate um, my own work? Is that kind of the question? <laughs> do you, do you I, sit I'm, at home I'm, surrounded by your own images and congratulate yourself on how amazing they are? <laughs> I got to say, um, I sadly don't have a single one of my photographs printed in my house. I just, wow. I can't look at my work at the end of the day because I feel like that's what I'm doing all day at my office. My gallery is filled with my images. Um, you know, when I get home, I want to look through books. I want to look at architecture. I want to look at typography. I'll, these are the, these are the places that I get inspired by. I think early in my career, it was focused primarily on looking at other photography, other images to be inspired. But now as I've gotten older, I, I don't, I'm not inspired as much by photography. I'm more inspired by like a beautiful, you know, song or again, some other creative medium, yeah, right? I, medium, I gain yeah. more, yeah, I gain more inspiration. I'm sure you can relate to that um, as well, but no, I'm not much of like a pat myself on the back kind of, kind of guy. I, I don't even, you know, I hate even like thinking about or looking at like awards or anything like that. So, yeah. So here's um, here's Brian's question. I'm going to switch across to your your inspirational wayward picture for the for the answer for this. But airline travel. So there's a, quite a in depth question, but I think it's probably a, a quicker answer, which is how do you pack your gear? What I need. Mean, this is quite specific, Brian. But how do you pack your gear? What sorts of luggage containers do you pack it in? How do you mark it? Um, and when traveling with more gear than you really want to carry, how do you decide what to send as checked luggage versus carry on? Do you have any airline baggage horror stories or have you not had any problems flying with your camera gear? Now, obviously, um, when it's sort of this sort of plane, that's a different conversation, I guess. Yeah. Um, but 
yeah, so in general, obviously, you're moving around quite a lot of kit around the world every now and then. So. I, I, I love this question. This is maybe my favorite one, to be honest, Paul, because I because travel is something that I, is an art form. And I love it. And, I, and I, I've done a lot of it. And yes, I have some horror stories. I have had 600 millimeter lenses stolen out of my bag in Hawaii on a way to a shoot. Like, I mean, just stuff that you wouldn't imagine stuff that's so stupid. I've had water housings cracked in half multiple times um, oh. on my way to Canada and other places. Um, we don't have time for all that, but I will say that I travel in this way. I, I bring on my back everything that I need, critical needs to uh, get the shoot done. Meaning most of my camera gear, I will bring on my back. If I'm bringing multiple drones, I'll maybe check one drone, but I will bring one with me. Um, Usually it requires, you know, being very cognizant of the airplanes that you're traveling on. So you can fit it overhead or you can fit it underneath because you might have an international flight that has a ton of space, but you might have to take that tiny pedal jumper to get the there. And, one. That yeah. one doesn't. <laughs> and there's nothing worse than getting there. And so I'm always thinking of ways I can like take my cameras out, my camera bags, just in the, the most minimal case, shove it overhead and then have a tiny bag to like stuff somewhere else. I use, um, a lot of uh, typically I'll, I'll bring like one big burly roller like a, a an eagle creek roller or a, a db journey roller or something like that where i can put tripods and wetsuits and gear and it's all kind of splayed out and um what i like to do is I'll, I'll create like a manifest for myself like here's my gear matrix this is what's in this one this is what's in the other one um because if you have two two of them and they're identical and you don't know what's in what um it's always good to go with like a different color or something like that um, I, I'll put an air tag in almost every single one of my bags. Um, as well. So many people I mean, are doing that now. Yeah. <laughs> they're so cheap. It's so easy to do. Um, I've got a multitude of them. So we, we will throw those into, um, our bags as well. And, um, that's been really easy and critical and, um, and helpful. And I'll, I will throw one with me in my camera bag as well. And, and if we have like a digi kit, like a computer laptop with hard drives, I'll put one of those in there as well. Um, and so typically if I'm, if I'm again, going to location, I want to bring everything that's essential. And that even means like if I'm going somewhere where I'm going to get off the plane and you need, you know, right now I'm going to Iceland next week. When I travel on the plane, I'm going to bring a pair of boots that I know if it's freezing cold, I can, I can wear those. Um, if yeah. you know, I'm going to bring a puffy jacket where I can get off the plane and throw that thing on. There's nothing worse than like, having to walk through the airport or walk off the plane and just be absolutely frigid and then have to go find your bag somewhere and, and sure. kind of make that work. Yeah. Sort of an, an essential pack, um, so to speak. Um, so I think I'm just conscious of time as well. Um, I think we're probably going to finish on one question, um, which was actually David. So mm -hmm. what's coming up in David. 2022 for you, Chris? Um, yeah, there's a lot, you know, I'm, I'm going to be working, uh, quite a bit in March, um, through Norway, Switzerland, Iceland. I'm going to be going over to my friend's memorial service next week in Iceland. Um, this weekend I'm going straight to Colorado to shoot a little bit of, uh, skiing and then bigger projects. I have like an expedition I'm planning for this summer, June, July. Um, I, there's still a lot of research to do there, but I'm, I'm in the preparation process of, of the, that. And then I'm also kind of working on trying to sell through a feature film that we shot um, this last winter about a bike, uh, a bike expedition through Iceland. And it kind of um, parallels somebody's journey with, um, with addiction and, and other things. So I'm, I'm working through that and yeah, I've got a, I've got a handful of bigger projects, personal projects, um, books. I'm, I'm working on another book. That's, that's more of like a how to guide, like kind of a, Chris Burkhardt's guide to um, take photos good and learn how to do other stuff good too. Um, maybe you get the Zoolander reference there, but it's supposed to be like a sort of a stripped down, no BS, more funny version of like how, like what you really need and how you can get away with it, you know, get it, get, sure. get away with, you know, making it work on the road. So um, I'm excited and that's uh, it's been, it's going to be a great year. Yeah. Cool. That's great stuff. Um, so, so, a, um, so number one, thank you, Chris. Um, obviously, an hour out of that is kind of a big chunk um, for your the rest of your day. And you have to go and check on your organic lawnmowers as well at some point today. Um, <laughs> yeah. So 
Um, but in the meantime, so for those people that want to know more, I guess, behind the, well, yeah, to a, to a certain extent, behind the scenes, that's the thing to buy. Um, so mm -hmm. Wayward, uh, which is the, the new book. For those people that, um, either, and actually genuinely liked the aerial images from Iceland or had some affiliation with, with Harold or and so on, then by all means, go on to Chris's site. Um, there's a section in the shop for Volcano Pilot and that, that sort of goes and supports um, all of that at the moment. And yeah, genuinely good luck next week going over. Um, but um, yeah, it's just never going to be a fun trip, but hopefully it's a, it's quite a pleasant one in terms of uh, I guess the uh, the the warmth that they'll have over mm -hmm. there for him because I know uh, a yeah. lot of people over there knew him. So yeah, cool. Um, so for everyone else that was on, thank you. Um, thanks for all the questions. Uh, we didn't get to all of them. Sorry. Um, we're not even going to touch on NFTs because that's a whole fun thing, um, and that's a that's a different let's, let's, session uh, entirely. Let's, uh, let's do it next time. Let's have another. Let's have another interview. We can, I'd love to be back on. We can do that. Yeah. Cool. All right. So with that all said, thanks very much, Chris. Um, great to see you. And um, to everyone else, take care. And we'll catch you next time. Cheers. All right. Bye-bye. Cheers.